it's kind of mind blowing that so many people who are crazy rich are super evil. And how can these things be? Like, why is it that crazy rich people are super evil? That's a very controversial question to ask. Now, before I even get started, let me say this. I am not implying that rich people are evil. So don't, don't misread what I just said. I'm implying and stating as a fact that evil people are rich. And I want to show you from a biblical perspective why that is. But I have here with me none other than, all the way from across the pond, the illustrious Bishop Wayne Malcolm, the business bishop from London. Hey, hey, hey. Glad to have you here, Doc. So he and I are going to discuss this together. Now, here's what's interesting. When we get together and start vibing, we're vibing, and we, we can have a conversation about something that we've never talked to each other about and be like, like singing in the same key. And that's what's about to happen right now. So I want, to, I want to tell you biblically why evil people are rich. And then I'm going to have Bishop's going to answer that question. I'm going to answer that question. And we'll go back and forth. Or, you know, I just might start us off and let him take over the world and just move out the way. I don't, I don't know how it's going to go down, but it's going to go down. Let's go. So here's what it says. Luke chapter 4. This is a story we're familiar with. And, and I'm sure you're familiar with it as I'm familiar with it. And I've been going to church my whole life since I was probably one year old or two years old. Went to vacation Bible school. Uh, graduated from a Christian school. We had chapel every morning. Went to a Bible college. We had chapel every day. And then I've heard thousands of sermons. Hear me when I tell you. Thousands of sermons. I've never heard anybody preach on this passage. Ever. About the part I'm about to show you. Okay. So. Here's what it says, Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And those days, in those days, he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterwards hungered. Okay, cool. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command thee st this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered and said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, this is the part, this is the part, pay close attention now. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. All the kingdoms. Everybody say kingdom. kingdom. All the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The word kingdom is a compound word. It's from the word king and the word dominion. So a kingdom is the dominion over which the king reigns. It's his jurisdiction. It's his Kingdom. We don't understand the concept of kingdom in the United States of America. We don't have the ability to understand the concept of kingdom because we live in a so-called democratic republic. Now, American government and other governments around the world are supposed to be a government of the people, for the people, by the people, allegedly. Okay? But a kingdom is a government of the king, for the king, by the king. Don't get it twisted. Now, I'm going I'm I'm to tell you this story. 2008. <laughs> I'm in the UK. I am speaking at his church. And it was an older, rundown, dilapidated, cathedral-esque building with concrete floors, oak pews, drywall on the walls that was not painted. And I, man, I, don't, man, I preach in storefront churches, bro. I, I don't, I preach in the projects. In, in Chicago. I don't care nothing about this building. He says, Brother Myron, we used to have a much nicer building, but the queen <laughs> took it. And in my American way of being, I said, what you mean she took it? And then he said, she needed it for something, so she took it. Now I'm even more confused. And I said, something Something. She needed your church building for something and she took it and you're okay with that? He literally took two steps back. Like he was about to get struck by lightning. Or I was and he didn't want to, like, he didn't want to get the afterburn. <laughs> right? Yeah, right? He, he step, took back, step, like, and then looked at me like I was the craziest person on earth. And he said, it doesn't matter. And she's the queen. <laughs> and then he said, you do know why the queen's money picture is on all our money, don't you? I said, no, why? He said, because it's her money. 
And in that moment, I realized I did not understand the kingdom of God. In that moment, I'm like, I don't, I don't understand the concept of kingdom, clearly, because nothing he said made sense to me. Okay, so hang in there with me now. Verse five again, I'm gonna read it again. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee. What power? The power of kingdoms, the power to build kingdoms. All this power will I give thee and the glory of them. The glory of them what? The glory of them kingdoms. I'm gonna give you the power and the glory of kingdoms. So here's what, here's what we know. Kingdoms come with power and they come with glory, right? So that's what kingdoms come with. Okay, just want to make sure y'all, we all own the same page. And then it says, this is the part that I've never even heard anybody mention before. He said, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. So I've got two questions. When I read that, I'm like, I got two questions. That's right. Who gave it to him? That's question number one. And the question is, who do you think he wants to give it to? I think those are good questions. And so the answer, who gave it to him? Some people say, erroneously say, well, God gave it to him. No, 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 no. God did not give Satan the power to build kingdoms. Who gave it to him? Adam and Eve gave it to him. Adam gave Satan the power to build kingdoms. I said Adam and Eve because Adam later called her name Eve. God called their name Adam, right? So, so, so Adam gave Satan the power to, be, build kingdom, to, to build kingdoms on the earth. Why? Because God gave Adam the power to build kingdoms on the earth. Do not miss that. The, heaven gives earth meaning. Earth gives meaning heaven expression. Earth exists as an extension of God's dominion. But because it is a physical realm and God is a spirit, God needed a spirit with a physical body to rule over the physical realm. And so he made man. See, when God created everything in Genesis chapter one, he created three categories in Genesis, uh, cre three categories of creation. He created creation, let there be. You, how can I tell if it's creation? Let there be, let there be light. It's part of creation. Are y'all tracking? When God, when God said, let there be, he was creating creation. When God said, let the earth bring forth and let the waters bring forth, he was creating creatures. But when God got ready to make man, he didn't say, let there be man. And he didn't say, let the earth bring forth man. That's how I know the earth ain't my mama. I don't have a mother named, I don't have a mother named earth. My mama's name was Carolyn. In case y'all wonder. Okay. And he didn't say, let the waters bring forth man. Here's what he said. Let us make man in our image and let them have dominion. You were made for dominion. I was made for dominion. Now, I wasn't made for dominion over you, and you weren't made for dominion over me. See, God made man to rule over the earth, and then you, as an assignment, a part of the earth, you're supposed to rule over, part of it I'm supposed to rule over, part of it the business is supposed to rule over, part of it those of you watching me on YouTube are supposed to rule over. God made all of us to rule over a specific assignment on the earth. And the degree to which we rule over that assignment, that will determine the degree to which we have the power and glory of that kingdom. Are y'all tracking? However, however, God gave us the assignment to rule over so we could use that assignment to serve people. Now, Satan, his fake kingdom is a totally different kind of kingdom. His desire is for you to attempt to rule over people and then use those people to serve stuff to yourself. It's the exact opposite. So why are evil people rich? Well, it says, all this power is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Who do you think Satan has a desire to give the power to build kingdoms to with all the power and glory of them? God's children or Satan's children? Now, here's the problem. 
Some of y'all don't like to think about the fact that Satan has some kids. Well, everybody's God's child. Okay, if you're that delusional, I will leave you to yourself. But clearly, everybody is not God's child. In fact, I remember Jesus saying to a group of Pharisees, you are of your father the devil, and the works of your father you will do. Satan has children. See, we don't, in, 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 in Christian, modern day Christianity, we don't like talking about this. We don't like talking about the facts that there are lost sheep, there are saved sheep, and there are goats. There's no place in scripture where the Bible talks about God turning a goat into a sheep. See, part of the problem with the modern day churchianity, I believe, is God, Christ established his church as a means of feeding the sheep, but we have turned it into a means of entertaining the goats, That's right. hoping that they will turn into sheep. Jeez. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> and so the, the problem is, see, we want to be responsible for the outcome. But see, God told us we ain't responsible for the outcome. One soweth, another watereth. God gives the increase. It's not my job to get anybody saved. It's my job to be a witness. What's a witness's job? To determine the verdict? No. A witness's job is to speak on things they've seen and heard. Anyway, I'm, I, 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 I got sidetracked a little bit, but I'm back on track. Satan has children. Satan has empowered his children to build kingdoms that create wealth. And here's something he knows that you don't know. Satan can't stop you from building your kingdom. He can't stop you from fulfilling your assignment. He can't stop, he can't block all the blessings of doing that. So because he can't block your blessing, what he does is he mental blocks you from the blessing to do the same thing to you that he did to Eve in Genesis chapter three by making you believe that if you believe the opposite of what God says, that makes you more like God. What does that mean? Satan can't keep your blessing from you, so the way he keeps you from it is to make you think something's wrong with it in the first place. So he can make you, he can influence you not to desire the blessing that comes with fulfilling the assignment for which you were created. And so you know what we do? We will, avert, we will avoid and avert the blessings of the assignment even if it means abandoning the assignment. Because we don't want to do, I don't, I don't want to make too much money. I want to get into heaven. You're delusional. You don't even understand. Like you're reading the Bible out of context. You want to know what that passage means? It's easier for a rich man to, or for a camel to enter, the, uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You want to know what that means? I did a whole video on it. Just go watch it. Why, it's called Why a Rich Man Can't Enter Heaven. Go watch it. And it breaks it down in context exactly what that means. So it doesn't mean if you make too much money, you can't go to heaven. If that were the case, David couldn't go to heaven. Abraham was the first person the Bible says was rich. He couldn't go to heaven. Isaac couldn't go to heaven. Jacob, like, like so it, just logically reading the Bible, it can't mean the thing that you've been told it means, so it has to mean something else. So my, the question then becomes what? What is that something else? All I'm saying is there are so many followers of Christ who are living well below their privilege, well below their assignment, because they believe that there's something wrong with all the blessings that come with fulfilling that assignment. That's why crazy, so many crazy rich people are super evil. Bishop, you want to chime in? Wow and wow. <laughs> uh, that, that was... That was the introduction. That, yeah, yeah. And we never preach a long sermon. Nope. It's the introduction that takes all, all the time. time. Exactly. Okay, well, I, I think this is a really... Um, relevant subject because I think a lot of believers are uh, disillusioned when they look at the state of play in the world and wonder why it is that some of the most wicked people um, have control and, and management and access to so much resource and uh, righteous people are often renting from them, mm. borrowing from them, uh, utilizing them, and we're thinking something's wrong here. Well, the Bible is very clear about that particular issue. And what Proverbs 13, 22 calls the wealth of sinners is, is well documented in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And to understand the wealth of sinners, 
Uh, you have to go back to the beginning, the book of beginnings, the book of origins, the book of the Genesis. Wow. Uh, where, you know, Dr. Myron has been just just really clear <laughs> that, that, that God made man to have dominion over the works of his hands, according to Psalm 8, made him to have dominion, which means he was made to manage an aspect of God's work. Come on, right? Now. And with with that uh, with that dominion comes power and glory. So that Adam originally had this power to build kingdoms. And uh, again, a lot of people don't realize that the Garden uh, of Eden was really the starting point for Adam. Like he was supposed to master that, dress and keep it, and then expand it all over the world. So he was supposed to literally uh, subdue the rest of the world. Okay, so he had this power, but sin is always transactional. Okay, mm. sin, sin, sin is a transaction. So when when Adam and and I say that in the in the original uh, sense, you know, Adam Adam called Eve Eve, but right. God called them Adam, right? So so when Adam, um, you know, uh, ate from the forbidden fruit there was a transaction that took place. He lost his power and glory. Mm. We know he lost his power and glory because he became aware that what I just had has gone, <laughs> right? And, and then he sought a substitute for what he used to have, uh, which was fig leaves. So he lost his power and glory. Who, who, who took the power to build kingdoms? Mm. That was given to Satan. That's why when Satan says in the temptation, it was given to me, that's actually true. Now, people, are, you know, how can the devil say something that's true? Well, listen to this. The more, the more truth that you put into a lie, the more potent that lie becomes. Yes, if you strip all the truth out of a lie, it absolutely has no power. So you mm. have to mix it with as much truth as you possibly can. And if you're going to try and tempt the Son of God, you better mix your temptation with a lot of things that are true, right? Mm. So this was given uh, to him and he gives it to whomsoever he wills. Now the first chapter after the fall in Genesis is Genesis chapter 4. And in Genesis chapter 4, we see this playing out because Cain kills Abel. Mm. All right? Yes, sir. So he's wicked. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says that he went out from the presence of God. So it didn't, he didn't just go out, leave the family home. He went out from the presence of God. Mm. He rejected anything to do with God. And he's wicked. He's a wicked man. He's out of the presence of God. And yet the Bible says he went and built a city. Mm. Come on now. Built a city. <laughs> now, first of all, that's the first time the word city even appears in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So not only is this a big idea, it's a new idea. It's an mm. innovation. He's practicing innovation and creativity. And it's a really big idea because if you're going to build a family, right? If, if you're building a family, right? If you're expecting a family, you build a house. But if you're expecting a society, you build a city. So this man has great expectation. I'm going to build a city, okay? But not only is his vision big, and not only is it innovative, it's also generational. Because he says, I'm going to name the city after my son. Come on here. Come on. So he says, I'm going to build today for a future generation. Now I'm thinking now, now I understand spiritually why he has this power, this innovative, creative energy. It's because it was given to him. Mm -hmm. But I also think that there's a psychological reason too. And the psychological reason is that Cain knew that, uh, that the paradise his father lost was never going to be available to him. That the only paradise he was ever going to experience was the one that he built himself Come right here. here on earth. Now, that's an important distinction because Adam still believed that there was a paradise beyond the blue, mm. right? So on the other side of the gate where there was an angel, there's a paradise waiting for him. But Cain didn't think of it that way. Cain said, if, I, if I'm going to experience paradise, I'm going to have to build it myself. So he goes out to build the city and he has children, and it's entirely another subject as to where did Cain get his wife from and how did he have his children is entirely another subject, right? But 
He has these children, and I want us to imagine what it would be like to grow up in the house of a man who's building a city. Mm. You know, what sorts of conversations would you overhear? Because the conversations you overhear as a child, they shape your character, right? And they develop your mental muscle. And it's an important part of child psychology development that the conversations they're exposed to. So what sort of conversations were these children exposed to? Um, you know, did, did they hear about who was wearing what on Sunday in church? Mm, no. Uh, who could sing and who couldn't sing and who could preach? It? No. They were exposed to conversations about construction, about irrigation, about zones, about residential zones and commercial zones and about protection and defense. And when you grow up uh, uh, exposed to big ideas about big things, you become a big thinker yourself because that sets the bar. So it is no surprise that from Cain's lineage, from Cain's lineage, the most industrious, productive, and creative people appear in the Genesis. Right there in the same chapter four, several generations later, one of Cain's descendants is called Lamech. That's right. Just act like you know. Lamech. Right? Right. That's what I do in church. I'm like, of course, of course. Yeah. Lamech. Right? <laughs> One of his descendants is Lamech, but Lamech is a very wicked man as well because he's a murderer. He killed a man and wrote a song about killing the man. Mm. But his children are uh, Jabal, who is the father of all such as have cattle and live in tents. Now, this was an innovation because up until that time, people went out hunting for animals. Jabal said, why do we do that? Why don't we just raise them ourselves and then we'll have enough animals? Why don't we just move along with them and, and, and we'll have all the animals that we ever want? So he became the father or the captain of a new industry, a new idea. The second son was Jubal. He is the father of such as handle the harp and the organ. And so he now invents this entertainment industry. And then Tubal Cain is the original artificer of iron and brass. And so he took warfare to another level because he was able to, to create superior weapons. All of this coming from a very wicked line. Mm. Now, here's the question. What do you think the righteous were doing while the wicked were building cities? It's hmm. a good question. The righteous were building altars because, because in this exchange, right, what happened, what ha this is what happens when religion becomes a substitute for kingdom. See, 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 once religion becomes a substitute for kingdom, <laughs> You, you stop building kingdoms on earth and you, you look for a pie in the sky and you're forever appeasing the wrath of an angry God and paying for your sins with your, your, your supposed humility and contentment with all things. So what the devil gave to the righteous was, was a substitute for the kingdom while he fully encouraged the wicked to go ahead and build your paradise right here on earth. Now, the accumulative effect of that over many generations is that the wicked become more and more wealthy and the righteous become uh, more, more and more so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. Mm. Mm. And that is until Joshua. I'm going to say until Joshua, right? Because God says, Joshua, you see that land that flows with milk and honey? that has houses and wells and vineyards and all good things, that land that's inhabited by cannibals and devil worshipers, that land is your land. Mm. It's covenant land. Mm. It's land that I promised to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now you cross over this Jordan and possess what was originally yours. Come on here. And so it is true that there are wicked people handling your stuff. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Living in your house, 
driving your car and wearing some of the fashion that God put by creative design in you. And so we're living in a time now where there's a rising consciousness because the question, the question about why evil people are rich begs the other question, okay? Yes, why does. are so many righteous people content with poverty? Come on here. And we're content with poverty because we don't understand that the earth is our domain. Well. I wish I had some help in here. You got some help, brother. <laughs> see, see, heaven is God's domain. The earth is our domain. Yes, sir. He gave dominion to us. And I think of it this way. I think of it as as our domain as a lease, as, as an earth lease. What we have is a lease on planet earth while God retains the freehold. Now in the United Kingdom, if you are a leaseholder, okay, you, it, that comes with certain rights and protections and privileges so that not even the freeholder can enter the property without, without your invitation, your instigation, or your permission. All right. So that if you were to come home and see the landlord sitting on the couch, sipping a beverage from your fridge, you could call the police and the police will arrest the landlord and remove the landlord. I'm not sure it's the same here, but in our kingdom, that's how it is. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, so. Uh, God says, I'm the freeholder. The earth is mine and the fullness thereof. You're the leaseholder. And so I'm not even going to kick down the door. I'm not going to come in without your invitation, your instigation, or your permission. He never kicks down the door. Instead, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, then I will come in. Mm -hmm. That's actually why we pray. You know why we pray? We pray to legitimize God's intervention into human affairs mm. because actually no spirit entity has authority or license on planet earth without the invitation instigation and permission of a human being mm. which is why even when God wanted to save us and couldn't find a man that would legitimize his intervention he became a man to legitimize his on, intervention man. into human affairs <laughs> Not even a demon can operate in this realm without human cooperation. Yeah. This world was given to us by God, and it doesn't appear to me that our eternal destiny is floating on clouds with naked babies playing harps and, 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 and trumpets. It appears to me... <laughs> It's called European art, okay? <laughs> uh, European religious art at that. Um, it appears to me from a careful study of scripture that that new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. That it, the kingdom is not something we're going to, but it is thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven because the original intent was that the earth would be an extension of heaven, a colony of heaven, possessing the atmosphere, the character, the culture of heaven right here on earth. And so, so long as we now substitute this 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 kingdom message for a religious idea, we are now looking for our pie in the sky instead of building a paradise right here and right now. Mm, so good, so good. In, interestingly enough, the bishop's talking about Cain building a city. The word city in the book of Genesis is not a city like Tampa's a city. It's not a city like Miami's a city. The word city is a synonym for kingdom. Now, how do I know that? Because Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities. But in Genesis chapter 14, five kings came against Sodom and Gomorrah, and they took hostages, one of which was Lot, but also they took the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah. So cities weren't, it was a protected place, had a wall around it, 
and it had a king that ruled over it. So understand that this building, a city, is not talking about a city like, oh, it's just a city like Tampa or a city like Jacksonville. No, 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 no. It was a kingdom. It was a kingdom. And Abram knew who he was based on who he, whose he was so much that when he found out that these five nations came and took his nephew hostage, he armed the servants that were born in his house and he waged war against five nations and won. Right. And we're afraid to stand up for our children in a school board meeting. Anyway, just thought I'd throw that out there. Do you want to share something else, Bishop? Well, you know, I, I just think that we're living in very exciting times and perhaps a crossroads in, in history where uh, we get to decide, not simply to choose, but mm, to, to so decide good. that we are going to fulfill our purpose. Uh, and our purpose is is God's original intent. Purpose, another you don't change. another definition, uh, an, another way of understanding purpose is that it's original intent. Mm. God's standing by His original intent, yes, which means He's going to get in the end what He wanted in the beginning. Mm. Which is why Genesis uh, and Revelation. Uh, uh, possess the striking similarities. The things which disappear in Genesis as a result of Adam's transgression, they reappear in Revelation as a consequence of Christ's victory. The things that appear in Genesis like sin and death and suffering, um, they disappear in Revelation as a consequence of Christ's victory. Because uh, God is going to get in the end exactly what he wanted in the beginning. And as we align, and, and what, what did he want in the beginning? Sometimes it's really, really clear when we're looking at Genesis, this is what God wanted. He wanted the earth to be an extension of heaven, uh, ruled by people who are ruled by God, mm -hmm. governed by people who are governed by God. He made all of it for us, all of it for us, but he made us for himself. Mm -hmm. And he says, you can have all of this so long as I can have all of you. Um, if you look at all of the all of the so-called warnings about money and riches in the Bible, they boil down to one thing, okay? It's okay for you to have it all, but it's not okay for it to have you. Well, Simple as that. Simple as that. Because that was the original intent. And when you look at the environment in which God planted the original man, it is luscious. It is fruitful. It is protected. It is prosperous. It's a place of provision. And the very first thing that God does for the man that he creates is he blesses him. And God blessed him. And God said, that's God's original intent. Poverty is not the will of God, okay? Lack is not the will of God. Amen, amen. Um, you know, destitution is not the will of God. Suffering, it's not the will of God. And people who feel like, well, if it's the will of God, it will, no. The will of God is not being done on earth as it is in heaven, which is why Jesus told us to pray that the will of God will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now we are at this crossroads where we get to decide, are we going to be kingdom ambassadors and citizens or are we going to be religious pilgrims who can't wait to get out of here? Mm, so good. It, you're talking about God's original intent and God's original design. Understand God's original design and God's original intent for abundance and wealth and prosperity is his people. We have to study the Bible in context of itself. We have to, does, like, we, we, could just do some, we could do some logic studies and I could ask the question, does God want us to be drunkards, yes or no? No. no. Does God want us to be lazy, yes or no? no. Does God want us to be gluttons, yes or no? No, no. okay. Uh, does God want us to be wise? Yes. Okay. So why does, the, why does the scripture say the drunkard and the glutton shall lie down together and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags? If he wants us to be poor, then he also wants us to be gluttonous, drunken, lazy people. Right? It just, there's no escaping that. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow with it. Like, if poverty was so pious, 
the blessing of the Lord would make poor, not rich. The substance, the physical substance that represents wealth all around the world, does now, has since the beginning of time, is gold. I used to wonder, why is gold so valuable? It's the same color as copper. It's the same color as brass. There are, all three of them are metals. But yet gold is worth more. Why? Well, let's start with the first reason. Because God said so. That's good. That's the first reason. By the way, and if that's not a reason, there is no reason. Let's always start with this. God said so. But the second reason is because copper and brass both corrode and deteriorate over time, but gold does not. Gold is a symbol of eternity because it does not corrode. Are y'all tracking? Now, here's what's interesting. The substance of gold is mentioned in the very first book in the Bible exactly eight times. If we want to know God's original design for anything, let's find it in Genesis. If we can find out what it was used for in Genesis, we can find out what God's original design and God's original intent was. Well, how many times was gold mentioned in the book of Genesis? Exactly eight times. That is so significant on so many levels that I don't have time to count them all. Why? Because every number has significance. One is the number of unity, unity of God. Two is the number of holiness or separation. Three is the number of God. Four is the number of the earth. Five is the number of man. Six is the number of, um, I mean, five is the number of grace. Six is the number of man. Seven is the number of um, completion. Eight is the number of abundance, eternity, infinity, and the new beginning. If you take an eight and turn it on its side, it is the symbol for infinity. But gold the substance that represents abundance is in the book of Genesis eight times. Genesis chapter one, God uses the adjective good to describe what he had made seven times. The eighth time he used the adjective good was in Genesis chapter two when he said there's gold in that land and the gold of that land is good. See, wealth is not inherently evil and it's not inherently neutral. It is inherently good. Why? God said so. And see, we have all of these internal inhibitions because of these religious lies that we've been taught that have been handed down from generations because we, the person who taught it to 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 us, none of them studied it and figured out what it was talking about. And so we, we, we literally are superstitious around Bible verses while we're ignorant of the Bible doctrine. Mm. Are y'all tracking? Eight times it's mentioned. Every time in the book of Genesis. Every time. Which time? Every time. Every time gold is mentioned in the book of Genesis, without exception, it's always mentioned in conjunction with God's people. How many people were in the Garden of Eden? Two. Two. What was their relationship to each other? Husband and wife. How many stores were there? None. What was for sale? Nothing. Everything was free. Okay? So there's no stores. There's nothing for sale. There's two people. They're married to each other. But God puts gold there, and he doesn't just put it there. He goes out of his way to tell us it's there, and he goes out of his way to tell us that it's there and that it's good. And where it is. And where it is. Now, let me ask you a question. And where it is. Let's don't forget that part, right? So why would he do that? Because God wants us to understand that opulence and abundance are natural resources in the environment for the children of the king. The first time gold is mentioned, it's mentioned in Genesis chapter 2 as providence for God's people. Providence means to provide in advance. God put the gold in their assignment before he put them in the assignment to tend the assignment. The next time gold is mentioned, is mentioned in Genesis chapter 13, verse number two, and it says, and Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. I've got a trick question for you. Was Abram rich? No. He was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. I love the fact that it tells us he was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. you know why? Because if he didn't, we would have spiritualized it. Well, when it says he was very rich, it just meant he had a rich and godly heritage. That's why God said, I ain't just going to tell you how rich he was. I'm going to tell you how he was rich. He was rich in cattle and silver and gold. That's the second time it's mentioned. As a possession by God's people. The next time it's mentioned, it's mentioned in Genesis chapter 24, I think it is. And that is proof of God's blessing on God's people when Eleazar gave um, Rebekah's brothers and mother gold to prove God had blessed his master and he was leaving all of this wealth to his son. And that's who I'm looking for a wife for. Not the last time, but one of the later times it's mentioned, Genesis 41, 42. This is the only time in the book of Genesis we see gold being 
something that a person who's not a child of God has. And here's what it says. Pharaoh took the chain off his neck and put it on Joseph's neck, took the gold ring off his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. That is a provision for God's people. Which reminds me of a verse that I'm going to read. And then I'm going to turn it back over to Bishop before we, and let him wind us up. It reminds me of this verse, and there are so many verses in Scripture that teach this. this is, I, I used to, you, you know what used to bother me when I first came to Christ and I started reading the Bible? I'm like, why did God tell the children of Israel to spoil the Egyptians? Go borrow something and then just leave town? That ain't cool. Sure, it's cool. They was working for it for 400 years. <laughs> God said, I'm doing this. By the way, let me, let, let, let's understand something. God does not tell us to do something because it's right. It's right because God told us to do it. Let's don't get that part twisted. Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Check it. Hear what it says in verse number 26. It says, for God giveth to a man that is good in his sight. What kind of man? Good. What kind? Talk to me, y'all acting like y'all scared. What kind? Good. God give it to a man that's good in his sight. Wisdom and knowledge and joy. What does he give him? Wisdom and knowledge and joy. And then he says, but to the sinner. He didn't say and to the sinner. Which means whatever he gave to the good man, he about when he said but, he's about to give that sinner something else. This is not a connection. This is a this is a contradiction. Are y'all tracking? But to the sinner. He giveth travail. What's travail? Hard labor. Why is he giving the sinner hard labor? To gather and to heap up. He's given the sinner hustle and grind, hard labor to gather and heap up. Why? That he may give to him that is good before God. I didn't put it in my Bible. It was in there when I got up this morning. Bishop, take us home. Wow and wow. Um, You know, quite clearly, God has scheduled uh, a time in human history where the wealth uh, of the sinner is going to end up in the hands of the just. Um, But as a prelude to that, we're going to have to unlearn some things because uh, unlearning uh, bad ideas is is more difficult than taking on a new idea. Well... And if we don't unlearn what we've learned about wealth and money, then we may end up rejecting the answers to our own prayers because we don't recognize that this is, in fact, an answer to prayer. You know, one of the things I guess we, uh, we learn from the, the blank page in the middle of your Bible. Have you ever seen the blank page in the middle of your Bible? Mm-hmm. Does anyone still have a physical Bible, by the way? Um, uh, yeah? Okay. Well, between Malachi 4 and Matthew 1, there's a blank page. But that blank page is loaded because it represents 400 years of history. Yeah, someone's got the blank page right there, I see. (laughs) Uh, So uh, that blank page is loaded because it represents 400 years of history. Mm. And those years are called by scholars the silent years. Mm. And they're silent because there was no prophetic voice in those days. And that's where we saw the rise of Greek philosophy becoming the dominant ideology for the world because there was an absence of the prophetic. It's John the Baptist that broke that silence when he declared that that he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. The fact is that in those 400 years, the Jewish people were treated with such hostility and barbarity Um, by successive regimes and governments and systems that there was one prayer, just one prayer in the heart of of, of virtually every family. And it was, oh God, send the Messiah. Our only hope is Messiah. And so for hundreds of years, people praying for Messiah. Then John 1, uh, I think John 1 uh, houses one of the most saddest verses, right? And here's here's the verse. It says he he it says he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Guess what? You can forgive the world for not knowing him, but the next part says he came to his own, and his own received him not. See, you can pray for something. And when it arrives, reject it, 
because of preconceived notions about what it's supposed to look like. Come on here. So it's very important that we unlearn some of the religious tradition that is that has held us back the sin that has beset us the sin of unbelief that has beset us in the matter of building kingdoms and creating generational wealth we have to unlearn it now i think that a starting point for unlearning it is to simply look at the financial statement of our faith heroes so that we can quickly reach the conclusion that there ain't nothing wrong with being righteous and rich. Right? And if we were to track all of our faith heroes, everyone that we tell our children to our role models, you're going to find their financial statement is packed with resource and capacity. Whether you want to start with Abraham, who wasn't rich, was very rich. rich. If you want to uh, jump over to Joseph, who was who, who in exchange <laughs> for his consultancy to the Pharaoh was given the land of Goshen. That's not a piece of real estate. That's a country. <laughs> he is so rich. He owns a country capable of popu- uh, capable of housing millions of people because mm. his family grew from. 70 souls to a nation numbering in the millions in the land of Goshen that Joseph held the deeds to that land. Mm. That's a wealthy man. And what about Moses? How rich was he really? Some people think, well, he wasn't that rich. He lost it. He was a fugitive. Well, he left with great spoil, right? He borrowed from the Egyptians. Well, really, he took back what the Egyptians had taken from, from, from them. And given the fact that that the Egyptians they borrowed from died in the Red Sea, there was no one to give it back to anyway, <laughs> and uh, uh, pretty much needed to carry on with it, right? Uh, but but out there in the wilderness, there was enough gold to make a golden calf. There was enough gold to overlay the Ark of the Covenant. There was enough gold to overlay the structure of the tabernacle with gold. There was silver. There were precious things right there in the wilderness what about joshua possessing the promised land flowing with milk and honey houses that you didn't build wells you didn't dig vineyards that you didn't plant a land full of all good things what about the kings of israel david solomon is it a coincidence that the wisest man who ever lived was also the richest man that ever lived go ahead bishop and he's part of our spiritual ancestry. These are our faith heroes. What even about the prophets? Okay, I think of Elijah sometimes. I think, hold on a second. Elijah had the power to control the economy of nations. He literally said, it's not going to rain here unless I say so. Mm. And, when I, and, 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 and then when I pray for rain, it's going to rain. So if you have the power to control the economy of a country, you have access to unprecedented resources and, and favor. We get over into the New Testament and we start thinking differently. Why? Because we were indoctrinated to think differently. Um, And that's a whole nother story about why that indoctrination is. But I'm going to wind up and kind of leave it here. I'm going to leave it here. I'm going to say, first of all, Jesus was not poor. He was very rich. And if you have any questions about that, you can go to my YouTube channel. I've got a great, great, great message on the financial statement of Jesus Christ. He was very rich. Look, if he was poor, there's no way that Roman soldiers, okay, employees of the Roman army, were going were gonna to gamble over his clothes. All right? I mean, you know, they, 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 they split one of his garments into four parts. Who wants a piece of someone's clothes Mm. unless that piece were pretty precious Mm. and when it came to his coat they said this is a special garment we cannot rip this it's woven from the top without seam Uh, one historian says they take about five years to make Mm. they are regal garments so that's Jesus wearing designer clothes that's And, and, you know, Jesus had, look, you have to watch that, right? Get to the apostles and to the early apostolic church. There's a very powerful verse that says, neither was there any among them that lacked. So this idea 
that poverty and piety should coexist. That a man of God should take a vow of poverty. That spirituality and materialism are two opposing factors. This is an idea that has been sold to us um, uh, to keep us uh, from possessing our possessions and inheriting what is ultimately our birthright. And if we can start to look at these characters and realize that these people were very righteous and very rich, then we'll start to believe that we can be very righteous and very rich and that these are not incompatible. That psychological work has to happen before the wealth of sinners comes into our hands. Otherwise, we'll sabotage our own success. Mm. We will reject the answer to our own prayers. Mm. We'll feel like we're perhaps doing something wrong. And I close with this. This is only my second close. I'm doing quite well. Last <laughs> night I did about four closes, right? <laughs> I had an interesting conversation with a rabbi and a very popular rabbi uh, has written some really great books. Thou Shalt Prosper is a book that I highly recommend everyone read by mm -hmm. Rabbi Daniel Lepin. But, but rabbi uh, uh, spoke for us uh, at, at an event we had in London and we spent some time together talking and he said, you know, he said, Wayne, you know, you inherited a disadvantage in a way that I did not. I inherited a financial advantage through my religion, but you inherited a financial disadvantage through yours because you were raised to believe that, um, you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. You were raised to believe that it's easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You were raised with all these warnings about money and wealth. He said, but, but for us, he said, money was always good. <laughs> Right. He said, uh, in fact, I was raised believing that it was my religious and moral obligation to create as much wealth as possible by serving my fellows so that we could take care of our children's children. And and for us, this was part of our religion. This was uh, We had a religious and a spiritual and moral obligation to do this. But for you, you doubt, you're hesitant, you're not sure if it's the right thing to do. And he said, the minute you overcome that, the minute you overcome that, then the sky's the limit for you. And so I set about doing my research to figure out what did it mean, the camel through the eye of the needle? What does it mean, the love of money, the root of all evil? What does it mean? And once you get to what it means, you then realize that it doesn't mean what we were told it meant. Amen. And that Amen. we have freedom and unprecedented liberty to go ahead and be the kingdom ambassadors that mm, God so destined and designed for us. So Amen. Good. Amen. Amen and amen goes right there. So that answers the question. At least it gets you on the road to an answer of why so many people are crazy rich and super evil. So let's don't let it stay that way. Amen. All right. Hope this video blessed you. In the meantime, in between time, we'll see you on the next Bible study. Bye for now. Is that all right? Bro. So are you in a hurry to get to Orlando or can you, can you field some questions if people have questions?